We are in week two of our series called Dirt as we look at the parable of the sower found in Matthew chapter 13. Last week, we talked about the idea that the kingdom of God is established very differently than the kingdoms of the world. We looked at the idea that even in human history, um, that, that kingdoms were established by external, external domination. So a king uh, brings in his kingdom, king brings in his army, he dominates a people, a village, a town, a continent, and um, he, the kingdom is established through his eternal, uh, external force. The kingdom of God is different in the sense that it comes like this seed talked about in Matthew chapter 13, uh, uh, what looks like a dead, innocuous seed that's planted in the hearts of man. And, and when taken hold of and when taken root, it changes people from the inside out. So I want you to consider and think about that the kingdom of God comes by hearing. This is how what Jesus says, the kingdom of God comes by hearing. And because of that, he says, be careful how you hear. Be careful. If the kingdom of God is established by hearing, be careful how you hear. This idea of hearing not being the, 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 the physiological auditory response of hearing audio sounds, but hearing by way of understanding and perception of the things of God, truly understanding the gospel. And Jesus points out that there's actually an issue. There's a spiritual hearing problem. And in Matthew chapter 13, verse 1, Jesus talks about how different people experience the the gospel, the word of God, the seeds of the gospel, differently. And Jesus uses the metaphor of the the seed being the word of God, and then four types of soil, four types of people's hearts, four categories of people that experience the, the gospel of Christ in different ways. And the, really, the, ultimately, the first three are warnings, and the last one ultimately is the way that God longs for us to receive uh, the seed of the gospel. Let's look to Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. It says this, That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered around him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. The whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears let him hear. And when the disciples asked Jesus, what does the parable mean? A few verses later, Jesus gives a very clear explanation about what each part of the parable means. Look at verse 18. It says this, hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what's been sown in his heart. This was what's sown along the path. This in week one, we talked about the idea of the hard heart of uh, the seed of the gospel, not being able to penetrate the hard heart. Look at verse 20. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, he immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on the good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, in another thirty. So last week we looked at um, the hard, the path. Right, the, the packed soil, the, the, the soil that's so hard the seed can't penetrate it. We looked at the idea of a hard heart. If you have not listened to week one, I encourage you to go back and do that. This will uh, be exponential help for you as you listen to today's uh, message. But today I want to look at what Jesus described as rocky ground. Look again at verse five. It said, other seeds fell on rocky ground and where they did not have much soil and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil But when the sun rose, they were scorched. Since they had no root, they withered away. And look at what Jesus, how Jesus explains that one again in verse 20. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. 
Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. So the soil we're going to look at today is this idea of rocky ground. And what des what's described by Jesus is ultimately shallow soil. It's just enough dirt for the seed to penetrate, just enough for the seed to germinate and it to break the surface and sprout, um, but, but that's really all it does. And he describes the people in this category as people that respond immediately to the gospel with joy. Like there's, there's emotional energy, there's, there's happiness at um, hearing about a God that's intervening on our, on our behalf. And, and Jesus gives us a sneak peek. He's actually giving the disciples a warning that just because people initially respond with joy, and just because, and it's, it's not just a warning for those that are leading and pe preaching and teaching the gospel, it's a warning to people in general that just because your initial reaction is one of joy and emotion doesn't mean that the root, a root is taken hold, right? It just means there's an emotional reaction. They express a response that, man, God's going inter to intervene on, on my behalf, and he is, just not in the way that they want him to. And Jesus uses a metaphor to represent um, adversity, and he uses the sun um, as that which is come, that the heat of the sun causes the plant to wither, and we see that Jesus describes in verse 20 that the, the, the sun, the metaphor of the sun represents tribulation and persecution. So let me, let me talk about those just for a moment. Tribulation is, the, is trouble and suffering in life. Um, it's pain, it's difficulty. It could be sickness, disease, death, loss, the loss of a loved one, uh, financial uh, distress. It could be relationship problems. It could be uh, heartache, failure, disappointments, natural disasters, discouragement. It could be depression, anxiety, betrayal, abandonment. Anything that's painful and difficult, that is tribulation, it's trouble in life. Um, and then he uses the other um, description of the sun, not just tribulation, but persecution. And persecution is when you are um, ill-treated or treated with hostility because of your faith in Christ, because of the word of Christ. And, and many people believe here in the United States, for us as a culture, that may, well, maybe persecution, that is just happens somewhere else, that happens in other countries with... Um, uh, tyrannical governments, and so the, ch the church really doesn't have to deal with that here. And I would just say that's not true. Persecution, the heat of persecution here in the States is alive and well, and the heat is dialing up. And how persecution looks like in the States is free expression of Christian thought about controversial topics. Like, for instance, um, things that will get a adverse reaction in our culture is even if you say these statements with a heart of love of just sharing what you believe to be true, for instance, if you believe, I believe that salvation is found through Christ alone and by no other path, by no other God, by no other religion, but through, but through Christ alone. If we make loving, humble statements of sincerely saying that abortion isn't a right, it's murder, you will get an adverse, painful response in our culture and if you stand up and even tenderly say, to say that marriage is designed between a man and a woman in our, in our culture, that's one of the hottest topics you can mention and teach on or talk about today. Even said in the most humble fashion, you can, you can get a devastating response and be treated in a, in a hostile way. Um, uh, family, friends, can uh, you can be ostracized by friends and family. You can um, not get promoted, lose a job because you shared your thoughts on, on these various topics. Um, I I'm seeing here, even in our culture today, um, there, there is not a way, there is not a way to authentically say and talk about some of these things without being... Ha <laughs> you can't genuinely speak and teach and preach on these topics without having, um, causing offense. And I believe that where people sometimes get hung up in the Christian faith and the Christian walk when it comes to these difficult topics is they think they can live an authentic Christian life without offending anyone. And the truth is it's impossible. You cannot lovingly, Jesus was the most humble person that's ever walked the planet and they still nailed him to a cross. So to think that somehow that we can avoid that, Jesus says, that, uh, know that when they hate you, they hated me, they hated me first. 
So we might say, well, what's the problem with this initial category of of person that receives the gospel with joy? Um, um, They have an expression of joy. Well, surely doesn't that joy point to life change? And Jesus says, not necessarily so. Now, when someone uh, within our church or in Christian relationship, um, as we share the gospel with them, when they respond with joy, we don't go, well, hold on. We don't actually know if this is authentic or not. We don't do that, of course. But it just goes to show that that initial response is not a telltale sign whether they're going to endure whether they're going to endure under the heat of persecution and tribulation in life. So what's the issue? What is the issue that keeps this category, this heart, this this shallow heart, these that where the root doesn't take hold, what is the reason that's happening? And uh, I believe there's help for us in understanding why, because one, we can test ourselves. Are we in this category of going to kind of going in and out of coming to Christ and then falling away? Um, And I think it'll help us too in just Christian ministry in general. The first thing we need to know that it's not the sun issue. You'd say, well, it, it sounds like they withered because of the sun, the heat of the sun, the tribulation, the persecution, the trouble in life, the, the difficulty. Well, all of these categories in this parable, they all face the heat and the light of the sun. All of them, and yet the one at the very end that Jesus talks about an exponential response of, of growth, um, actually thrives in the midst of the heat of the sun. So what's different about this soil? And the difference is, first of all, just remind me, being reminded that it's not the, the, the issue of the sun. The issue is there's a root problem. They don't have a robust root system, which is what a, a, a plant needs to survive. Uh, it needs a, a healthy root system that can bring the water, bring the nutrition to match the level of the heat of the sun that, that it's facing. So what's causing the root system to be stunted? What's causing it to not be able to thrive in the midst of, uh, of the heat of, of life? And when it comes to this category uh, of a person, um, I believe there's three, basically three rocks. Jesus describes that the ground is rocky and it's the rocks that are keeping the, the, uh, the roots being able to take hold. And I believe there's three lies basically that we take hold of that we believe that stunts our, that stunts our faith And the first faith-stunting lie is this one. God's main goal is my comfort and happiness. I think that's one of the first lies that people believe. They believe that when they place their faith in Christ, that it's going to be smooth sailing and that God's main goal um, is happiness. Especially here in America, we take hold of our pursuit of happiness. My pursuit of happiness must mean happiness is the end goal for, for God's plan for my life. And that's just simply not true. Most are looking... For God to many times be like a Santa Claus or uh, be like a divine slot machine that they just kind of push the buttons and the divine blessings and, and goodies, goodies come out. Um, I was reading this earlier this last week that there was a six-year-old boy named Noah in New York who got a hold of his aunt's uh, smartphone and, and he opened up the app of, of the phone, uh, the Amazon app of his phone and ended up ordering over $2,600 of SpongeBob popsicles that were actually brought up to the porch of that house. Uh, I was, imagine the response of the aunt as she opens the door and finds 918 SpongeBob popsicles um, that, that his, uh, this, her little nephew Noah had ordered. Can you imagine Noah's excitement and imagine his terror as, as uh, Judgment Day is brought down upon him because of what he had ordered online? Uh, And we laugh about that, but that's how many people sometimes think about God. They think, well, I I put my faith in God. I bring my needs and my requests to him. My desires, my wants to him. And I I punch it in. And what the equation, what that should equal to is God doing what I ask of him. And when God doesn't perform that thing they want, whatever it might be, they end up ditching God. their, Their faith fails them. They walk away and they go out to look to something or someone else that might provide and meet these needs in their life. And what this shallow heart reveals is this truth that many want the gifts, but not the gift giver. Many want the gifts. They don't actually want Jesus. They don't want Christ. They don't want God's leadership in their life. What they want is the gift. They want the movement of his hand in their life. They don't actually want him. And the minute God doesn't perform as they believe he should, they bail and they're gone. And ultimately that reveals that what they actually were worshiping wasn't God, it was actually the gifts, the blessings. 
it reveals the idols of their heart. So let me just say this real, real, real clearly for you. Happiness is not God's goal for your life, enjoying and glorifying it, him is. Happiness is not God's ultimate end for your life. Happenings are based on happening, happenings, uh, based on circumstances. Um, God wants to, uh, to grow and develop your heart to know him, to enjoy him, and to bring glory to him and bring purpose to your life through glorifying him uh, with the life that he's given you. Let's look at another faith-stunting lie that stops the, the, the roots of our faith from growing. Listen to this. Faith, the faith-stunting lie, uh, the second one is, God is only good when life is good. God is only good when life is good. And man, many people believe that, um, and they'll, they're willing to lift their hands, to express in worship, um, to talk well about God when life is good. But all of a sudden you introduce the storms of life, the bad in life. People believe that if God's good, I should never feel bad. And that's just simply, that, that's the result of an immature faith. Um, scripture tells us that the rain of life falls on the just and the unjust, that all of us have to walk through storms in life. And so that's a, it's a lie that many people buy into. Um, and it ends up, they become disillusioned and disheartened and discouraged when um, God doesn't act as he be, they believe he should. Here, here's the ne next lie. I don't need to count the cost before deciding to follow Jesus. They, they, don't, they don't believe they need to count the cost. So they, they're led by their emotions, their response, but Jesus is actually really good at reading the fine print. Have you ever seen those commercials, those pharmaceutical commercials of a breakthrough drug? Um, and many times maybe you've seen it's an image of a, a couple on the beach. Uh, maybe it's an older couple and it's, they're talking about a, pre, a breakthrough drug that can extend your life. Um, and it's a couple, they're dancing on the beach together, they're holding hands, they're splashing their feet in the water. I mean, life doesn't look any better than this, what this couple ex is experiencing. But if you'll notice that when you watch these commercials, the, the actor doing the voiceover of the narration of the commercial, right at the end of the commercial, they begin to, their voice changes, they begin to speak a little bit quieter and faster, and they begin to express the, the, um, the side effects of the drug. They, they begin to, to share things like, side, some side effects of this drug may include blood clots, blood, blood, blood clots, blood clots, uh, blood clots, um, brain aneurysms, hallucinations, um, suicidal tendencies, bleeding from the ears and, and uh, nose, cardiac arrest, and even death, all right? Now, obviously, we're wrecked when we think about, man, okay, all those side effects sound awful. I think I'll just stick with whatever I'm dealing with and just write it out. But the reason they have to um, read the warning label, even in the commercial, is because by law, they have to. They have to read what's called, what we might call the fine print, the thing people don't want us to have to say out loud in the transaction. But Jesus wasn't that way. Jesus was very careful to read the fine print. In fact, he says it this way in Luke chapter 14, when it comes to people seeing how, uh, seeing the need before they follow him to stop and before they make that decision to consider what they're saying yes to. Look at Luke, Luke chapter 14, verse 28. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and he's not able to finish, all who will see it will begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that, he, all that he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus is saying, listen, before you follow me, before you follow me, count the cost. This is not about just starting. Are you willing to finish? Are you willing to pay the price? Jesus tells us to count the cost. Not simply to, for uh, what we're going to endure and, and for the work we're going to be called to accomplish for him, but, but for in the tribulation and in the persecution, the heat of the sun that we're going to have to be faced with. And Jesus ultimately, in another passage, gives a description of the great pearl, a great price. So Jesus is worth it. He says, if a man finds a massive pearl in a property, he's gonna, and he goes and sells all that he has to come and purchase that land... It's because he knows that everything he sold and everything he walked away from it is actually worth it. Jesus is the pearl of great price and he's worth it. So the idea and the calling for us to count the cost is not to second guess whether Jesus is worth the tribulation or the persecution, not at all. He just says, have your eyes wide open to what you're saying yes to. 
so that you don't start something in your faith that you're not prepared to finish. Notice while these plants that have this shallow root system are withering under the sun, if you fast forward a couple of verses later in this parable, you see this plant that's not just thriving, man, it's exploding, right? Great growth. It's, it's thriving under the heat of the sun. How can one be dying and another plant be thriving under the same heat? And the answer is found in John chapter 15 when Jesus tells us to abide in the vine. Jesus says, I'm the vine, I'm the source, I'm the root system, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So what we need to be doing is abiding in Jesus, being plugged into him, finding him as our resource, not seeking to walk in our own strength or our own intellect, but being uh, 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 founded and grounded in finding our root system, our water system, the living water flowing in and through Jesus. He's the one that provides, us, provides that for us. And here's what happens when you place your root system in Christ in a deep way, what happens is that what might have harmed us in the beginning actually helps us thrive. Think about, maybe take you back to maybe high school science, where you would see a, um, uh, science would describe that part of what a plant needs is sunlight, photosynthesis, that when working with water and when working with a strong root system that brings nourishment to the plant, sunlight isn't a deterrent for the plant, it's needed. And photosynthesis begins to take place along with carbon dioxide. And this great exchange happens with light doesn't kill the plant. It actually causes the plant to thrive. Think about, consider, like, for instance, I, I've, I got with me today um, a solar panel. Think about how a solar panel works. Solar technology, at once foreign to us, um, acts as this... Uh, great invention that allows us to capture what once was wasted energy or wasted light to now, now receive, capture the light, and then converts it to strength, converts it to, to power for whatever we're plugging it into to bring power to us. Um, and in the same way, for the follower of Christ, Jesus does a conversion. What once might have been a detriment or a liability to us, Jesus comes along and allows, gives us supernatural, the resource, to actually take the heat and the light of um, uh, 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 tribulation and persecution and it actually be converted into strength and power to us. It actually becomes a, a betterment and a help to us. How do I know that? James chapter one. James chapter one, look at verse two there. It says this, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect, complete, and lack in nothing. So many times we would not see joy and trials or joy and suffering be put in the same sentence as a gift. And yet uh, James is saying, hey, you can actually perceive trials, pain, difficulty, tribulation, persecution, as actually you can perceive it with joy. Why? Because it's not going to be wasted because it says it's actually gonna produce first steadfastness. Steadfastness is this idea of un, un, uh, resolutely unwavering. It's, it gives us a backbone of steel that in the midst of the hurricane of life, I can still stand and endure. And he says, let that ability to stand and endure have its full effect. Have its full effect that what, of what? That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, meaning in the end, that trials are the very thing that actually bring about maturity and development for a child of God. It's like if you go to the gym, you need physical resistance to build muscle. If, um, if you don't have resistance, you, you can't build muscle. And in the same way, in our Christian spiritual journey, we actually need resistance. And the resistance that we face in this life is the heat of the sun in this parable. It's, it's tribulation, it's difficulties, it's pain, it's suffering, it's persecution in this life. This is the weight gym. This is the gym. This is the weight room of the Christian faith where we can be grown and mature. So why can we count it joy? When we count it, we don't, we're not thankful that we, we have to go through something, but we can be grateful and have a joyful perception because we know none of it's gonna be wasted. Not one drop of blood, not one drop of sweat, not one tear, none of our pain, none of our suffering is going to be wasted because in the end, Jesus is actually gonna work it all for our good. We're gonna be matured, shaped, molded. And in the same way, 
Jesus allows us to convert persecution, trials, suffering into maturity in our lives where it actually becomes a power source for us to mold us and shape us. And while other people might fold and walk away from the faith and disappear, for those that are under the heat of the sun in Christ, rooted in Jesus, exponential fruit is flowing. Life changes happen. We're maturing, we're growing, and we've got something to show for the suffering that's not just wasted. It's not just wasted on us. Tribulation is a part of life. The rain's gonna fall. The storm will come. But I can tell you that when you're rooted in Jesus, when you endure tribulation, when you're persecuted for your faith, when you're persecuted for unpopular, controversial opinions, when you're seen as um, your opinions being archaic and out of date and out of touch with culture, what you'll find is that when you're rooted in Jesus, you'll be able to stand. It won't be easy. It'll be painful. There'll be tears. There'll be, there'll be stress. There'll be some anxieties. Um, but we can endure and we can stand and we can actually have fruit in our life because we're able to stand and endure, not in our own strength, but because we're rooted and founded in Jesus. And that, with that, that type of heart and that type of response, we can begin to endure all kinds of things. We can endure relational pain. We can re- endure um, a cancer diagnosis. We can, uh, we can endure betrayal as Jesus did. We can intru- uh, 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 deal with abandonment. We can endure with uh, financial issues and, and, and chaos within our world. Why? Because we're rooted and founded in Jesus. And Jesus is longing to make sure and give us this warning that, that, that we not be satisfied with simply an emotional initial response to him, that we make sure that our roots are founded in him. So my, my challenge to you today as we wrap up is this, that make sure that you're not settling for a shallow faith that's going in and out. How do I know if I got a shallow faith? Well, um, are my responses to Christ more emo- emotional than transformational? Are, are, they, are they initial um, do I go in and out of church? Do I in and out of really being plugged in, invested and engaged with a church family? Do I go in and out in my spiritual zeal with God? Do I fall away and then have to come back again when I hit a really rough spot? It's because the root system's not taking hold. So maybe what's next for you is to begin to reflect and say, Lord, is this me? God, do you want to begin to pull some rocks that are lies that have been stunting my faith, uh, believing that God's ultimate goal has been my happiness and comfort? Maybe he's calling you to count the cost of what it truly means to to decidedly follow Jesus rather than every now and then chasing an emotional high in my spiritual journey. Jesus brings the warning to us, and I would say to you what he said, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. Let me pray for you today. Father, thank you for the gift of your word, and even when it confronts us Lord, I pray that, that we long for you. We'd so be such, so desperate for truth, so desperate to have clear eyes to hear and perceive what you're saying to us. God, I pray there would be a sense of humility right now of response. And I pray for those that are listening right now that maybe need to count the cost. Maybe some that have been buying into the shallowness of lies about God being all about comfort, our comfort and happiness. And maybe we've been frustrated and angry and thinking God should have done some things differently. We've been haughty and haughty toward God. Lord, I pray that you'd bring humility back again and that we allow you to begin to tend the soil and pull rocks out. Help us to be honest with ourselves about counting the cost and coming to you and making an ultimate decision saying, Jesus, you are worth anything. And God, I want my roots to go deep in you. I'm all in. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you today.